Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, again, my name is Bernard Wong. I'm an associate professor here in the School of Computer Science. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work that uh, my group and I, uh, together with a lot of amazing collaborators, have done over the past few years on building consensus protocols for specific applications. Okay? So achieving consensus is a fundamental problem in distributed systems. There's been a lot of work, past work, on allowing uh, participants in a group to be able to all agree on the same value or the same decision. Now they must be able to do this even in the event of no failure and also in an asynchronous environment where latencies may be unbounded. Consensus protocols have primarily been used to provide fault tolerance. A service or application can represent its state as a sequence of state changes that it records in a log and they can use the consensus protocol to replicate this log so that all the members have the same entries in the log and be able to have fault tolerance in that way. Okay? By doing so, the service remains available even if, uh, as long as a majority of the nodes are still uh, functional. Okay? So this is a very powerful uh, primitive is a very powerful property, and as a result, a lot of applications have been uh, built on top of consensus protocols, uh, the ones I've shown below, like Paxos and RAF and SAB. Okay, on top of Paxos, RAF, and SAB, uh, we typically build these coordination services like Zookeeper and Chubby, and they provide a slightly higher level of abstraction for applications to use. And at the very top, okay, we have distributed applications like Hadoop and HBase that make use of these fault-tolerant coordination services in order to solve problems like electing leaders or managing distributed locks. Okay, so before I talk about some of the systems that my group has built, I want to first talk, uh, provide some background on one of these existing consensus protocols. And the one that I've uh, selected is RAF, which is a relatively modern consensus protocol, and it was uh, designed with the goal of understandability as its main goal. Okay? RAF is a leader-based consensus protocol, so therefore uh, we must first elect a leader from the different participants. In this case, we have five participants. They all start off as initially as a follower. Okay? Now, node eight here transitions from a follower to a candidate. Uh, typically, this happens if it hasn't received um, some type of a message from the leader for some time. And as a candidate, it's going to send a vote request message to the other participants. And if it, if it receives a thumbs up message from a majority of the nodes, then it's gonna become the next leader for this consensus group, okay? So now once we have elected the leader, uh, all future client requests will be sent to this particular leader. So in this case, there's a client request for a state change setting X equals to one, and that will be sent to node A, which is the new leader. Uh, node A is going to forward these requests to the other participants. And uh, once it hears back from a majority of nodes, uh, once it knows that this data has been seen by majority of nodes, uh, it can then uh, commit the requests as well as apply the state change to its own state machine. And after that, it will respond back to the client. Okay? So there's some key properties about this protocol and about most consensus protocols in general. First, RAF, like most consensus protocols, require uh, 2F plus 1 replicas in order to handle F faults. A RAF leader, in this case, you can see that it does a lot more work than its followers and a lot more traffic has to be sent to the RAF leader. And uh, RAF requires uh, at least two network round trips in order to commit uh, state requests. And finally, the followers, in this case, they must be provisioned with enough resources to become the leader in case the leader were to fail. Okay, so RAF is a really nice balanced protocol, but it may not be well suited for a number of uh, applications with very specific performance requirements. Its leader-based design means that it has limited scalability. And an emerging application that many of you, I'm sure, are aware of is blockchains, which requires consensus uh, between a large number of participants. Applications such as fault-tolerant geo-distributed uh, database systems also have very strict latency requirements. So, uh, now, RAF is able to do this in two network round trips, which is not unreasonable, especially with, with it, it's uh, within the same data center. But in a geo-distributed database system, these different participants are you know, located around the world, and two wide area network round trips may be too much for these systems to, ha uh, to, to, to be able to handle. And finally, cost is often a big concern when we're, talk when we're deploying these consensus systems, consensus groups. Uh, resource efficient consensus protocol is therefore very important, okay, especially for like cloud vendors or cloud tenants and cloud providers because you don't want to spend a lot of your resources on, uh, on you know, essentially running these consensus systems. Okay? So for these reasons, we have built different consensus protocols that are specifically targeted for these different performance metrics. 
And today I'm going to go through uh, basically these systems one at a time. So the first system that I'm going to talk about is called Canopus, which is our scalable consensus protocol. Okay. All right, so Canopus is scalable for two main reasons. The first is that it is a completely decentralized design. Uh, there's no distinguished leader in Canopus. And what this means that is uh, that it has improved uh, load balance. Uh, the, there's no uh, network congestion at the location of the leader. The second and po possibly more important reason for its scalability is because it takes advantage of uh, modern data center design. So for example, it takes advantage of the high performance networks that are available in these data centers, and it also takes advantage of the hardware redundancies that typically are built into these data centers. Okay? So let me dig a little bit deeper into our system assumptions to motivate the design of a protocol. So we assume that the network has uh, non-uniform latencies and link capacities, so participants within the same uh, within the same uh, rack is going to have a lot more bandwidth to each other than uh, participants across different racks or across different data centers. And this is important because the scalability of many of the existing consensus protocols are limited by network bandwidth. Okay? So, and this motivated us to build a consensus protocol that is network topology aware. We also assume that Canopus will be deployed on racks of servers, potentially in the same data center or even across different data centers, and these racks are going to be connected with redundant links. Each rack should have enough Canopus servers and hardware redundancies on shared resources like uh, switches and power supplies to ensure that a full rack failure is going to be extremely rare. And because of those redundant links between the different racks, we also assume that network partitions are very rare as well. Okay? So we therefore optimize Canopus for the case where these failures do not happen. So we're optimizing for the common case. The protocol is still correct or still safe if these were to happen, although uh, the performance wouldn't be quite as good. Okay? All right, so let me outline exactly how we perform consensus. Okay? So uh, much like in other consensus protocols, we break up the time, uh, consensus time into a series of cycles or sequence of cycles. And uh, in each cycle, Canopus tries to determine the sequence of write requests that were received in the previous cycle, the order of the uh, write requests received in the previous cycle. In this example, we have six Canopus servers, and four of them have received the write requests in the previous cycle. And at the end of the cycle, what we hope to do is for all the servers to see the same sequence of write requests. Okay? Now, in order to take advantage of these high performance uh, networks, the high uh, band network bandwidth within a rack, we actually group all the different participants within the same rack into something we call a superleaf. And then we use an intra superleaf consensus protocol to allow these participants to exchange state, so to exchange the right request and to order them. Okay? I'm going to talk about the intra superleaf consensus protocol a little bit more in a few slides. Okay? Now, the state of uh, superleaf is therefore a sequence of right requests received by the members, and we can represent that state as a height one virtual node. Okay? So in this case, we have two superleafs. And we have two height one virtual nodes, B and C. Okay? So the next step, once we have uh, performed the intra superleaf consensus protocol and we've created these height one virtual nodes, is for these height one virtual nodes to exchange state with each other in order to compute a height two virtual node. And state exchange is actually fairly straightforward. I'll talk about that a little bit in a second. The main reason why it's straightforward is because the virtual nodes themselves are already fault tolerant. We've already performed consensus within the superleaf, and as a result, uh, we're just performing state changes between uh, fault tolerant nodes. Okay, we've repeat this process okay, uh, h times for a tree of a height h in order to eventually compute the state of the root v node. Okay, and the state of the root v node is essentially an ordered sequence of the right requests received in the previous cycle. Okay, so now let's look at our intro superleaf consensus protocol. Okay, this protocol relies on using reliable broadcast, which can sometimes be hardware accelerated if the nodes are within the same rack as a way of disseminating state between different nodes. Alternatively, we can just use multiple instances of a consensus protocol like RAF to perform the reliable broadcasts. In this example, we have three nodes, and each of these nodes received some requests from different clients in the previous cycle. Now, the protocol uh, works by first uh, creating a proposal message uh, that contains a random number plus a list of write requests that the server has received. And then it will use reliable broadcast to send these proposals to each other. Okay, so at this stage, all of the nodes within the superleaf will have received all of the different proposals, but the proposals may be in different order. Okay? And finally, we order these proposals simply by sorting on the random number. Okay? So once this is all done, we have finished 
computing this particular consensus round, every node now has the state of their height one B node. All right, so now we want to perform uh, you know, consensus across the superleaves. And the way this works is that uh, each of these um, um, superleaves with their height one V nodes will elect a representative, okay? And that representative's job is to go to other height one V nodes or other V nodes of the same height and fetch state from those V nodes. So in this case, uh, uh, V node B has, uh, has elected node F as a representative and F is going to fetch the state of V node C from node I. Node I is an emulator for V node C, which means that it has the state of V node C. In this case, G and H are also emulators of V node C, okay? So node one, okay, so node F will send a proposal request to the emulator, and then the emulator will send a proposal response containing the state of V node C back to, uh, back to the representative, okay? And once the representative receives the state of the remote vNode, it will use reliable broadcast to send it to the other members of its superleaf, okay? Now, in this case, a representative failure is fairly easy to handle, okay? The representative superleaf will, at some point, okay, probably after some time out, determine that the representative has failed and will elect a new representative. Uh, if an emulator fails, that's pretty easy to handle as well because the representative will, at some point, time out trying to receive uh, a proposal response from that emulator, it will then send a request to a different emulator, okay? Now this solution might seem very simple, and in fact it is, and the part of the reason is because of some of our assumptions. We assume that uh, because we've replicated the state within a superleaf, and because of the fact that we have all these hardware redundancies, a superleaf cannot fail, and we cannot have network partition, and as a result, the protocol really boils down to uh, state dissemination between a number of fault-tolerant nodes, okay? Now, the consensus cycle ends once we have uh, performed the state exchange and, be and uh, we are able to compute the state of the root fee node, okay? So hopefully it's clear from this example that this is a network topology-aware protocol because of the fact that most of the data traffic that we're sending is within the same superleaf, okay? Most of the cross-superleaf transfers are only done once and it's not repeated by multiple nodes within each superleaf. All right, so uh, unlike most other consensus protocols, uh, read requests in Canopus can be handled locally by any Canopus node. The read request does not need to be forwarded to a leader. It doesn't need to be disseminated to the other nodes in the system. Instead, we are able to provide linearizability by simply buffering or delaying read requests until the end of a cycle when that, when, at, at, at which point we know the global ordering of writes. And then locally, once we know the global ordering of writes, each node will order the pending read and write requests received at that node, okay, in order to preserve the request order of the clients, okay? This significantly reduces the bandwidth that we need in order to perform these read requests and allows us to, uh, to determine a total order of the read and write requests, okay? So uh, we've implemented the system, we've deployed it both lo locally in our own data, cent our own uh, data, um, I don't wanna call it data center, but our own machine room, as well as in the cloud and we've uh, compared it with a number of different systems. So here I'm only gonna show one, one of these experiments, one of these comparisons, where we compare Canopus with Epaxos, uh, the current state of the art in consensus protocols. Uh, these graphs show the latency and throughput of Canopus and Epaxos. And uh, we start off with only just nine nodes, and with nine nodes what we found was that uh, Canopus was able to achieve a much higher throughput compared to Epaxos. We were about uh, we're achieving about three million operations per second versus about a million operations per second. And as we increased the number of nodes going from nine all the way to 21, what we found was that the throughput of Canopus actually increased from about three million to about five million operations per second. Now part of the reason for that is because this is a read mostly workload, but for this same workload, Epaxos actually had a reduction in throughput going from uh, I don't know, about one million operations per second to closer to maybe half a million operations per second, okay? Now one thing to also notice is that uh, Canopus's latency is a bit higher than that of Epaxos, and the reason is because in Epaxos, uh, it's able to complete a consensus cycle as soon as it hears back from the nearest majority of nodes, where in Canopus, we actually have to wait until we hear back from at least one node from every single superleaf, okay? Our experiment, 
Okay, so our experiments have uh, shown that Canopus is uh, more scalable than uh, some of these other consensus protocols. However, it has a number, number of limitations that makes it not particularly suitable for maybe some uh, classes of applications. So for example, we trade off fault tolerance for performance. Our system does not handle full rack failures very well or network partitions. It basically stalls until uh, these failures recover. We trade off latency for throughput. So as we saw in the previous uh, slide, our latency is a bit higher than some of our competing systems. And finally, stragglers in the system can hold up the, the completion of a consensus cycle, okay, at least temporarily. And uh, this is more of a problem for uh, transient stragglers, for more persistent or permanent stragglers. Uh, we can identify these and remove them from our system. Okay, so one of our motivating applications uh, was originally blockchains. So one question to ask is how suitable is the system for blockchains? And my answer is uh, it's a step in the right direction, but it doesn't really get us all the way there, uh, maybe not even close. Okay, and the main reason is because Canopus only tolerates crash stop failures, and most blockchains require a Byzantine fault tolerant protocol. So this means that Canopus can really only be used in blockchains that rely on some other mechanism to establish trust between the different members. So for example, if it's using something like a trusted execution environment and has remote attestation. And there are blockchains like that. So for example, Microsoft Coco uh, uses exactly these techniques to provide trust, and we could in theory use Canopus with this particular blockchain. Okay. However, to support other blockchains, we are currently working at building and extending Canopus to support Byzantine fault tolerance. Okay, so that's the first system that I want to talk about, this uh, scalable consensus uh, protocol. The second one that we, I want to uh, share with you is a low latency consensus protocol that we've built uh, for uh, fault tolerant geodistributed database systems. So geodistributed database systems are things like Google Spanner and Krakush TB are often used to manage data generated by, generated by users that are located all around the world. Uh, these systems can store data near the users, okay, at a nearby data center, and by doing so, it can reduce the latency it requires to service uh, some of the transactions submitted by these users. Uh, and they have two additional properties in addition to having low latency. One is that they are fault tolerant. Okay, and they provide fault tolerance by using a protocol like Paxos to replicate the, their state across multiple data centers. And this allows them to be available even if an entire data center were to fail. Okay? And they are also scalable by essentially sharding or partitioning their data and storing only a fraction of, each part, of the partitions in each of the data centers. Okay? Now, generally, most of the transactions in these systems execute pretty quickly. Um, and and that's exactly what you would hope, uh, but it relies on the fact that these transactions only touch a single partition. However, you know, multi-partition transactions are sometimes unavoidable, and these transactions can take a long time to complete in a Google Spanner-like system. So let me walk through exactly what the steps are to perform a multi-partition transaction. Okay? So, in a, uh, so this is the basic architecture of Spanner or Spanner-like system. Uh, we have multiple partitions. Each partition contains a number of nodes uh, organized with, with a leader and follower, so they're basically a consensus group. There's also a coordinator. The coordinator is essentially the, the two PC coordinator to make sure that the two-phase commit uh, is executed correctly, and that's also fault tolerant. And the uh, protocol starts with the client sending read requests to the partition leaders. Okay, it's gonna read results from these partitions, it's gonna perform some computation based on those uh, read results, and it's gonna decide whether it wants to commit or abort the transaction. If it decides to commit the transaction, it's gonna send a commit request to the same partition leaders, and it's also gonna include the updates that it wants to perform as part of that tran uh, tran <clears throat> transaction to those partition leaders. The leaders will independently determine whether it can prepare the transaction or if it has to abort the transaction, uh, it will, it will, it's able to prepare, prepare the transaction if it's not conflicting with other concurrent transactions that are currently running in the system. Once it makes this decision, it will uh, perform a state transition, but before it can continue with the protocol, it needs to replicate that state to its followers. So it needs to first replicate the fact that it's changing a state from whatever it was before to the prepared state, and once it's been fully replicated to these followers, then it can send the result to the to the leader, essentially sending, telling the leader that it is uh, okay to prepare this transaction. The leader will then 
uh, determine whether it can commit that transaction, and if it decides to commit, it will replicate that decision to its followers before sending the final response, the committed response to the clients, okay? So this is a fairly lengthy process. It's simple, it's easy to understand and reason about, but it takes a long time. Uh, a lot of these steps have to be executed sequentially, and as a result, that uh, requires very high latency to commit this transaction. We're talking about, about four and a half uh, wide area network round trips, where a wide area network round trip could be 100 milliseconds or more. Okay, so it can take maybe half a second to commit this transaction. Okay, so that led us to design and build um, Carousel. I always get the two systems mixed up, Carousel and Canopus. That led us to uh, build Carousel, which is uh, a low latency geo-distributed transaction processing system. And uh, it's able to uh, com commit a transaction in at most two wide area network round trips if there are no failures. And it does this with, through two optimizations. The first is that we're able to parallelize read operations with the 2PC prepare message, okay, with, the, with the prepare phase. Okay? And we can do this by essentially uh, reducing our transaction model. Instead of supporting general transactions, we instead support a powerful but somewhat less general uh, transaction model called the two round fixed set interactive transactions. And in this model, uh, one of the main requirements is that we have to specify the read and write keys at the beginning of the transaction, okay, before we start executing the transaction. Okay? So that's one optimization uh, that we have introduced. And I'm not gonna talk about that today. It doesn't really follow the theme of consensus. But the second uh, optimization does, this is where we try to parallelize our 2PC prepare with replication, with the consensus protocol itself. Okay? We do this by introducing a fast path that allows us to uh, complete both of those phases in just a single round trip. And this borrows a lot of ideas from fast Paxos. Um, and in, th in addition to that fast path, we also execute a slow path concurrently, which is very different from other systems. Other systems also introduce a fast path, but they only execute the slow path if the fast path were to fail. In our case, we're able to execute both at the same time in order to reduce the worst case latency. And this uh, optimization together with the first one allows us to uh, be able to commit some transactions in just one wide area network round trip. Okay, so let me go through the basic protocol um, of the second optimization with you. So here uh, we have uh, the coordinator, the transaction coordinator and the client. In our model, we assume that the coordinator and the client are located in the same data center. This is a fairly easy to, um, to this requirement is fairly easy to meet because the client in this case is usually a, a data center application. Okay, so we have a client and a coordinator in the same data center and they want to send a prepare request to, the, to a partition, okay? So we're gonna borrow ideas from Fast Paxos. Instead of sending it just to the leader and then having the leader send it to the followers, instead it sends the prepare request to all of the replicas. Okay? And the replicas will all independently determine whether it can prepare the transaction. And if they all make the same decision, or not all of them, but if a super majority of these nodes make the same decision, and that decision is sent to the coordinator, then uh, both of these phases have completed. So both, we've finished performing our 2PC prepare. Okay? As long as a super majority of these nodes agree on the same decision, we can do this entire operation in just one round trip. Okay? And the reason why we need a supermajority is that we want to make sure the system still reaches the same uh, conclusion, even if we have F failures later on. Okay? Now, unfortunately, this fast path doesn't always succeed. Sometimes it will fail. And it could fail because of the fact that these different replicas are receiving transactions in different order. Okay? Uh, so there may be multiple concurrent transactions, and all of them may receive them in a slightly different order. And as a result, uh, in this particular case, one of the followers will decide to abort the transaction instead of uh, preparing the transaction, okay? What this means is that the fast path will fail, and once it fails, okay, using a fast Paxos-like approach, the coordinator will then resend uh, the prepare request over the slow path just to the leader, and the leader will now replicate its log entries to its followers essentially forcing the followers to see the same sequence of, trans, uh, of uh, requests that it saw. So this will force them to see the same order, and as a result, they will all arrive at the same decision. And finally, once it's done that, the leader will send back a response to the coordinator, and now we're done with our 2PC prepare, okay? So this is still relatively efficient. It only takes two round trips, but it occurs after we've actually performed and failed the fast path. 
Okay? And so in total, it takes three round trips whenever, uh, we, it takes three round trips for us to be able to complete this whenever the fast path fails. So the main idea of our approach is that we've modified the consensus protocol so we can perform both the slow and the fast path at the same time. Okay? In this particular example, we perform both at the same time. The fast path fails. However, we don't need to wait until the fast path fails before we start the slow path, and the slow path will actually complete in two round trips. So we're saving one round trip whenever the fast path fails. So whenever the system experiences contention, okay, where the ordering might be more likely to be uh, rearranged in, at different nodes, our system can complete these transactions in one fewer round trip. Okay? Now, how do we go about doing this? Well, the main idea is that we want to make sure that if the fast path succeeds, it will always come to the same decision as the slow path. If it fails, obviously, it doesn't matter what the decision is. The slow path can make whatever decision it wants. But if it succeeds, it always has to make the same decision as the slow path. Okay? And the way we accomplish this is to modify the consensus protocol such that the fast path only succeeds if the leader is part of the supermajority. Okay? It's not enough for the, a supermajority to be reached. The leader also has to be part of that supermajority before we're able to say that the fast path is succeeded. Okay? So uh, this is basically the high level approach of our, of our change to the consensus protocol. It introduces a lot of corner cases, as you might imagine. And a lot of the work that we've done is to kind of uh, introduce additional small mechanisms in order to handle all these different corner cases. Unfortunately, I don't really have time to go over each one, but I'd be more than happy to talk about them if you have questions. Okay? So we've implemented the system. We've deployed it again locally and in the cloud. And uh, we have actually implemented two versions of it. We have Carousel Fast and Carousel Basic. Carousel Fast includes both optimizations, and Carousel Basic only includes the first one. It doesn't include the consensus-related optimization. And we compare it against Tapir, which is a state-of-the-art uh, low-latency geo-distributed transaction system. And in this particular experiment, we used the retwist workload. This is a, a Twitter-like transaction workload. And what we found here is that our latencies are much lower than that of Tapir. So in the median, uh, we can complete this, uh, the transactions in just 232 milliseconds compared to 334 for Tapir. And perhaps more, what's more interesting is looking at the tail. The tail latencies for Tapir is quite long, where the tail latencies for both Carousel Fast and Carousel Basic is quite a bit shorter. Okay? And they end at about the same spot. And part of that reason is because of this optimization that we introduced. Okay? So, so that was our work on building low latency uh, consensus protocols for these geo-distributed transaction processing systems. So the last uh, system that I want to talk about briefly is our resource efficient consensus protocol for the cloud. Okay? So when we're talking about consensus in the cloud, cost is often the main concern for both cloud tenants and cloud providers. The need for two F plus one replicas can be quite costly, especially if the value of F is quite large, or if the cloud provider is actually hosting a large number of consensus groups. Uh, what's more, the nodes, each node, as I mentioned earlier, must be provisioned with, uh, with enough resources to become the leader, even though it might spend its entire lifetime as a follower. So these requirements led us to build a system called SIF, okay, a resource-efficient RDMA-based consensus protocol. In SIF, we logically separate um, request processing from state storage. A SIF deployment consists of two types of nodes, CPU nodes that have only a minimal amount of uh, memory, enough to store just some soft state, as well as memory nodes that only are provided with a sliver of CPU. Okay? And the job of the, these Memory nodes, these passive memory nodes, are to store the log in a state machine. Okay? So in the cloud, it's fairly easy to be able to uh, allocate these uh, memory-only or CPU-only instances. And ideally, the price of a CPU-only instance and the price of a memory-only instance together should really be about the same as the price of a CPU plus memory instance, although obviously that depends on the, cost or the charge model, the, charging, the pricing model of the different cloud providers. The CPU nodes in the system are used as coordinators and backup coordinators, but instead of communicating with the memory nodes over something like TCP, we use one-sided RDMA to allow these CPU nodes to directly read and write to the, to the memory of these memory nodes. Okay? So one-sided RDMA is a key enabling technology for this particular work. 
Again, it allows a node to be able to read and write directly to a remote node's memory without involving the remote node's CPU. And this allows us to be able to build these really passive memory nodes. These memory nodes are using no CPU during normal operations. Okay? Without one side of RDMA, if we were using something like TCP, uh, these memory nodes still needs to use a lot of CPU in order to basically just handle the network requests, the network uh, traffic. All right, so here's the basic architecture of our system of SIF. In this example here, we have three memory nodes and two CPU nodes. Uh, the memory of the memory nodes are divided into three parts. We have our write-ahead log, our key value storage system, as well as an administrative region. The CPU nodes here are only storing soft states, so things like the term ID, as well as the timestamp of the last heartbeat that it received. Okay? So this is a leader-based consensus protocol, so one of the first steps that we need to perform uh, is leader election. And leader election happens a little bit differently compared to other consensus protocols. What we do instead is to have each CPU node use RDMA CAS operations, these, uh, these one-sided remote compare and swap operations to write to the administrative regions of each of these memory nodes. And they basically fight to write their ID into these uh, admin regions. And if a node is able to write its ID into a majority of these regions, it becomes the new coordinator. Okay? So in this case, uh, CPU node A wins this particular fight, it becomes the next coordinator. Okay? Uh, the administrative region is also used for other purposes, like for example, reading and writing heartbeats. Okay? So uh, this design, okay, in this particular design, we are able to uh, provide F, uh, tolerance for F failures using two F plus one memory nodes, much like other consensus protocols, but we only need F plus one CPU nodes. And the reason is because the CPU nodes don't actually directly talk to each other. Um, they instead talk through the memory nodes, and as a result, we actually don't need majority agreement between them, okay? All right, so let's look at how we uh, actually handle a write, a write request. So a write request will be forwarded to the coordinator, just like in other leader-based consensus protocols. Okay, the coordinator will then use one-sided RDMA to write to the write-ahead logs of the different memory nodes. And once it hears back from a majority of those memory nodes, once those uh, majority of those writes are, have completed, then it is able to um, apply those changes locally in a local cache, it is able to commit that transaction or that particular, uh, not transaction, but that particular state change request, and it will be able to respond back to the clients. Okay? Now, in this case, if the coordinator were to fail, uh, handing over to the backup is fairly straightforward. The backup node just needs to apply any uncommitted uh, log entries into the key value store, and it doesn't require any state transfers in order for it to become the new leader because the node is essentially, the CPU nodes are essentially stateless. Okay? So in this summary, uh, in summary, the design uh, reduces the cost of our system by only requiring F plus one CPU nodes uh, instead of requiring two F plus one CPU nodes that you would normally need. Okay, you won't think of them as CPU nodes, but you don't need two F plus one CPUs that you would normally need if this was a standard consensus protocol. Okay? Now, perhaps a greater opportunity to reduce costs to, uh, to increase savings is in the environment where you have a lot of consensus groups. So in the cloud, you might imagine having hundreds or thousands of tenants, each running their own consensus groups. And if they were using SIF, what we can do is to have all of them share the same set of backup coordinators. These backup coordinators aren't really doing very much other than essentially uh, checking the timestamps of the, of, the, of the heartbeat messages. So instead of having backup coordinators for every single group, we would just have a pool of backup coordinators that are used for all of the consensus groups running in the same data center. Okay? This allows us to significantly reduce the cost of deploying these systems, and if uh, the number of backups are insufficient, we can always instantiate uh, additional backup servers fairly quickly. This is the cloud, and these nodes are basically stateless. Uh, one more thing that we do in SIF is that we also use eraser coding as a way of reducing the memory requirements of the different replica nodes. Uh, eraser coding allows less data to be stored while providing the same degree of fault tolerance. Uh, you can think of it something very, it's similar to something like RAID 5, although uh, that's another type of coding scheme. It's not the one that we use, but it has a similar property to allow us to provide a level of redundancy without necessarily replicating it to every node. Okay? Now, the complexity of consensus protocols in the past have made it very difficult to make use of eraser coding. 
Okay, you basically don't want to make a complex system even more complex by introducing eraser coding. However, SIF's replicated memory model actually makes it really simple for us to implement eraser coding in our system. And by doing so, we're able to, uh, to significantly reduce the costs of, uh, of SIF's deployment. And the main trade-off being that our recovery performance reduces because if there's a node failure, we may have to read from more nodes in order to reconstruct the data that's stored inside these consensus servers okay, or inside the memory nodes. Okay. Again, we've implemented SIF. We've uh, deployed it in different places. We've done a number of different performance measurements. But the performance numbers aren't really all that interesting because we're not aiming to provide a faster or more scalable consensus protocol. Instead, we're mainly concerned about the costs of deploying the system. But so we compared the deployment costs of SIF okay, with RAP as well as SIF with eraser coding. Now, part of these will assume certain prices regarding these memory-only instances and CPU-only instances. Of course, we don't really know how much uh, Amazon or these cloud providers will charge, but we are making some assumptions here. Uh, the cost savings that we found increases as we increase the fault tolerance level. So for a value, F value of three, what we found was that eraser coding um, require, okay, so SIF of eraser coding requires only about $40,000 a year to deploy for this particular configuration compared to over $110,000 per year for a RAF deployment, okay? And of course, the deployment, the deployment cost drops even more if we were uh, sharing these backup coordinators across multiple SIF, uh, multiple SIF clusters and multiple SIF groups. Okay, all right, so in conclusion, uh, consensus protocols have been used in a lot of, as a building block for a lot of different distributed systems. Uh, there are many new and emerging applications that require very uh, specific performance requirements from the consensus protocols and current general purpose consensus protocols are not particularly well suited for these applications. Uh, custom consensus protocols, like the ones that we've built, can make certain assumptions or trade-offs that general purpose ones cannot. And by doing so, they can meet some of these application requirements. And uh, today I've presented three consensus protocols that we've built that uh, address the requirements of three very demanding applications. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Yeah, David. Right. Right. So the coordinator doesn't have to be um, in a partition that you're accessing data from. So we can pick a coordinator from basically any partition that we want. So. That's right. That's uh, so we're talking about so we're talking about a single client, so an application running at one of these data centers, and we're assuming that these data centers running these applications will also be running uh, running a carousel node, okay? Basically, running some of these servers. So we can simply pick the carousel servers running in the same data centers to serve as the coordinator for this particular application. Right, but then the guy, the, the person in Spain, he's performing a separate transaction, and for him, when he's performing his own transaction, touching the same data, okay, in these in these different uh, data centers and these different partitions, it will choose its own coordinator. So the coordinators don't have to be the same. So every transaction can use a different coordinator to coordinate the two-phase commit. Transactions that overlap on the partition, they can use different coordinators. The coordinators are just for the two-phase commit part of the transaction. So we're not using the coordinators for locking, for anything else. They're just to ensure that uh, all the partitions all are in the prepared state so that they can perform a commit or that, you know, uh, that all the partitions at the end decide to abort the transaction. So we can have different coordinators for transactions with overlapping data. Okay. Me <laughs> Great, thank you.